Thank you. So uh, moving on, we'll have uh, Todd Morse now uh, presenting uh, Swipe, an open source infrastructure as code for running Widow workflows at low cost. Thank you. Please go on. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'll be presenting on Swipe, uh, which is the workflow runner that we use on um, the Transarchoperk Infectious Disease Platform, or uh, CCID. Uh, we run a lot of workflows. Our biggest one is a uh, managed genomics workflow. Uh, so Swipe is uh, infrastructure as code, uh, and uh, specifically, we're using Terraform. And what's so cool about this model is that we can define the infrastructure we run in the cloud as an open source module so people can see exactly how we've configured it, uh, use the module themselves, and then also uh, make changes to it as they see fit. Um, so it is this Terraform module. It creates all of the AWS infrastructure we need to run these little workflows using a lot of different AWS <coughs> technologies like Step Functions, Batch, S3, Lambda, uh, and uh, MiniWiddle, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. And with Swipe, you can run a workflow with S3 inputs, um, and then you can make one call to the AWS um, API, and then you can get your outputs in S3. So it should be pretty easy and user-friendly to use. Uh, so some of the advantages to using Swipe is the minimal infrastructure setup. Uh, so it's almost as simple as a managed tool in that you just call the module, you can spin it up, and you can start running things in one call, and you don't have to worry about, say, maintaining servers or scaling, because uh, all of that is configured for you. Uh, another really key thing is that it's highly optimized for working with large files. And this comes out of our metagenomics use case where, you know, kind of our reference is all of NCBI. So we're, for every single run, dealing with files that are indexes on all of NCBI. So we are really optimizing for dealing with those large files. And to that end, we've configured uh, instances that have NVMe drives. They also have really high um, bandwidth connections uh, to S3 that we saturate with a uh, parallelized downloader that is built into Swipe itself. So we can get those files down and process them extremely quickly. Uh, we can also share those downloaded files between different workflow runs that are running on the same instance. So these large files can only be downloaded once and then reused on all the workflows that run on the same instance. Um, another key benefit of Swipe is the cost savings we've been able to achieve while um, preserving both throughput and latency. Um, so the core thing that Swipe allowed us to do really easily is run on spot. And what Spot is, is kind of a deal you make with AWS where they will give you cheaper computers, but they can also turn those computers off on you without warning. So the key to making use of these deals on Spot is that you can pick up where you left off. And I'm going to talk a bit about how we do that, um, but by creating a framework that allows us to pick up where we left off and also to retry on demand if we're interrupted on Spot, uh, we can get workflows done, uh, run really quickly. And because we retry on demand after one failure, you're at most going to wait twice the length of a workflow and usually much, much less. Uh, we also have built-in monitoring, and we can use AWS to easily integrate with some of our other services. Uh, some key disadvantages to Swipe. One is if you're not using AWS, so Swipe is defined as AWS infrastructure, uh, so it's pretty tightly coupled to that. Um, the other one is if you're running distributed or big data jobs. So it's not optimized for, uh, it's, it's optimized for workflows with local files. So if you're running something like um, MapReduce or Spark or jobs like that, uh, Swipe really won't help you there. Uh, and then also, if you want a completely managed solution, uh, so since we wrote Swipe, for example, AWS Omics has come out. There are other managed solutions that just run Whittles for you out of the box with literally zero maintenance. Uh, they'll be a little bit less customizable, and they have different performance characteristics. But if you want something that is completely turnkey, uh, then Swipe might not be for you. Uh, the core technologies behind Swipe, uh, the big one is AWS Step Functions. When you submit a Swipe workflow, you're submitting a Step Function. Um, so Step Functions are an AWS service that allow you to coordinate between different kinds of other AWS services. For example, Lambda, which lets you run little snippets of code. Batch, which lets you run Docker images, or I think other images as well. Uh, ECS or EMR, for example, which we're not using, but they're just examples. Um, it also handles the task dependence. You can see that you have kind of a directed acyclic graph of different tasks, as well as different choice states uh, for navigating between those graphs. And we can handle errors in different states and then retry different states based off the definition. Another key technology that gains us kind of our performance characteristics is AWS Batch. And that's what the step functions are actually directing the compute to run. Um, they run containerized jobs at a large scale. You kind of put jobs in the queue, and then the queue depth is what determines how many instances you uh, bring up on your compute instances. But all of this is handled for you. Uh, what's cool about this is it combines a lot of the benefits of serverless, which you might have heard about in terms of being the new trendy thing, but you, sometimes we still need to configure servers, like for example, reusing the same local drives between jobs to preserve those files, like I talked about, and configuring something so specific as using specific kinds of drives and how you're configuring those drives. Uh, so it kind of has given us the best of both worlds in terms of scale and uh, customizability. The last piece I just wanted to touch on that we use is uh, Whittle. 
and specifically the mini Whittle runner of Whittle. Uh, so Whittle is a uh, uh, domain specific language for specifying workflows, it stands for workflow description language. Uh, you can, it's a little small there, sorry about that, uh, but you can specify a workflow as a series of tasks. Workflows have inputs, tasks, and outputs, and tasks have inputs, uh, the command that is being run, as well as the uh, runtime of that task. Uh, in the workflow itself, you can chain together outputs of some tasks as inputs to other tasks, and the Whittle runner kind of determines a dependency graph of all of those different tasks and passes those inputs and outputs through. I put in a little context onto Swipe uh, originally, but it was kind of born uh, from the Zuckerberg Infectious Disease Platform. Uh, we originally actually had a different custom DAG runner uh, that was giving us a bunch of problems, and that was just kind of a simple Python framework that was more code-based. Uh, and it was just run in batch on its own. Um, we had a bunch of problems with that. It was very difficult to debug. And we had some infrastructure problems from some of the more custom infrastructure that we were doing. Uh, so we did a big refactor onto AWS Step Functions. And then we actually had another internal project um, uh, for uh, Genepi, or uh, Genomic Epidemiology. And they had similar workflow running constraints to us. So we wanted to put it in a module so both teams could use it. And then once we did that, we could kind of have an open source uh, project that a lot of different people could benefit from. Uh, the way that Swipe works itself, and I've kind of touched on this when I was talking about the technologies, is that it's kind of a nesting of coordinators. So the step function coordinates the high-level batch job running. The batch jobs then run the mini Whittle runner. So all of your tasks are actually running in the same batch job. So even though it might be confusing that the step function has a DAG, your workflow will be represented as a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. Um, there are actually two separate things. So it's a bit of a workflow within a workflow. Um, the top level one is kind of managing that spot negotiation, whereas the bottom one is managing the actual steps of your task. Uh, to get a little bit more specific, um, we coordinate first with a Lambda, which is just a little bit of code that takes the inputs to your call to the AWS um, API, and then remaps them to the inputs that we're expecting for your, your um, workflow. And then we actually try to run the workflow on spot. If it fails, we check why it failed. If it failed due to an interruption, we'll try again on demand. And then after that, we process the outputs and we show them to, um, well, not, not the user, but we return them. Uh, so basically, uh, AWS has since added also some uh, retry functionality as part of batch, but we're using the uh, retry functionality built into step functions. Uh, this just gives you a closer view of uh, the general workflow with everything kind of filled in. And it also, uh, gets to the next fact of how do we get uh, outputs out of this system. And we do that mostly through uh, S3, which is just kind of this very flexible uh, blob store for files. Uh, we're uploading all of those different outputs from different steps dynamically into S3 as those tasks are completing. Uh, and then we can also be informed of when workflows complete through this AWS event bridge that uh, can actually populate events about your um, workflow into a task queue. Uh, so we, for example, have a web app front end. That web app wants to know exactly when a workflow is done, so it can just listen to those events and process them. In addition, the lambdas put your inputs and save them to um, S3. So we have the inputs to your workflow, and then the workflow itself running in batch uh, puts everything into uh, S3 as well. Uh, the actual files that are the outputs, and the inputs and output format is JSON. Earlier, I mentioned that we can pick up where we left off, and the key to that is this call caching feature. Uh, and this is kind of... Um, something that I added relatively recently. Uh, but what call caching allows us to do is pick up where we left off. So for every step, we compute a hash that is a combination of all of the inputs, the content of the command, the output definitions, um, not the output files themselves, as well as the runtime. So if that information remains the same, then we can know that we don't need to rerun this step. Uh, this was implemented by MiniWiddle, the local runner. Um, but the thing that was added to Swipe is that this is now backed by S3. So as a task completes, the output files are uploaded. And once that's done, an entry is put into an S3 cache that is also maintained um, through the same directory structure that Swipe uses that knows uh, where to put it. So then subsequent runs can check for S3 for the cache entry instead of having to run them all locally. Uh, if something is found in the cache, it's down, the output is downloaded from S3 where it already is. So you can pick up where you left off if you're interrupted with uh, spot interruptions. What's really cool about this is that developers can specify checkpoints in their workflows where they can pick up where they left off without having to worry on a case-by-case -case basis how they're going to recover from interruption. Uh, so by using the Whittle semantics, it's kind of given us this for free on behalf of the implementer. Another thing that was added relatively recently, which is uh, I'm excited about, but it's a little bit more minor, is just that uh, we can expire intermediate outputs. So essentially, um, outputs are passed from tasks to inputs of other tasks. But sometimes we don't really care about that intermediate file. 
However, it's not obvious if a file is going to be intermediate until the end, because sometimes there are selections of different possible outputs based off of some runtime information about which one actually becomes the final output. Because Whittle supports ifs, it supports different selection functions. So until the very end of your workflow, you might not know if you need it or not. And we also need to upload these intermediate files for the purposes of call caching. Uh, so the way that we've been able to solve this is at the end of the workflow, we know which files were the final files, and all other files are tagged with an S3 tag, uh, which is a feature of AWS S3. And then we can set what's called the lifecycle policy, which makes those files uh, deleted after 14 days. Uh, this has been really nice for us because it gives us enough time to debug in the case of something failing, and it also uh, allows us to pick up where we left off in the case of an interrupt, but we're not saving these very large, in our case, intermediate files um, for all time. And it's automatic, which is nice. Uh, I also just wanted to highlight how it's relatively simple to use and get started with and kind of show a bit of the Terraform. Uh, so this is the minimal Terraform to bring uh, Swipe up in a fresh AWS account. Uh, so with just a few lines, you can have kind of all of this infrastructure running for you. There's lots of customization options, but there's sensible defaults, hopefully. So uh, you can run it just from this. You just need an S3 <coughs> bucket to be your file input and output workspace, as well as an S3 bucket to store your actual Whittle code files. Uh, they can be the same if you like, but it's, I, I tend to keep them separate. Uh, then you reference the Terraform module, which is in GitHub, uh, and you can spin everything up. Once you have spun everything up, you can just use the regular AWS API to run your Whittles. Uh, the most difficult part is that you have to craft the input, and uh, this is on the readme of the, uh, the GitHub page. Um, so this is an example using Python. However, AWS has SDKs in a lot of other languages, and you can even use the raw HTTP API to run your actual workflows. Uh, you need to specify a name for your run. Uh, you need to specify uh, which step function ARN you want to use, uh, which will be an output of the module that comes from uh, Swipe directly, as well as a URI or an S3 path to your actual little code. And then you can just put your inputs right here under run. Uh, so here we just have one input called hello, which is just a simple text file. Uh, almost done, I just wanted to talk also about um, the actual development of Swipe and how uh, we kind of manage that development workflow process. Um, so one thing that is interesting about Swipe is that we have kind of these uh, features that are deep dependencies on both uh, AWS features as well as some code that we write. For example, call caching runs some custom code inside of the Docker image that we create that runs on the batch jobs, but then it's also dependent on the behavior of S3 as well as the behavior of batch itself. Um, so we use an open source library called Modo, uh, which is mock Bodo, which is the AWS SDK for Python. Uh, as well as the official AWS uh, Step Functions Docker image to run a mock version of AWS uh, either locally or in our CI CD machines. Uh, what's really cool about this is that developers can um, test Swipe locally from end to end without an AWS account and also without spending all of the time to spin up all of the AWS infrastructure for real and also all of the cost. Uh, so for local development, uh, we have a Docker Compose file where you can spin everything up and run tests uh, locally really quickly to kind of make a fast iteration loop. And then for CICD, we run this against mock infrastructure. Uh, this enables really rapid uh, iteration without using the account. And it also uh, allows us to be really confident about uh, swipe features. So just like a little aside anecdote of how this has been really helpful is that there was a very subtle bug where only the first uh, step was ever cached. And this is something that would have been really, really difficult to find without having you know, this reproducible testing loop uh, where you can test the caching from end to end. Uh, so that's been very helpful. Uh, we still want to add a lot to Swipe. Um, so for example, uh, we only have notifications when whole workflows are complete uh, instead of per task, and we want to add those. We want to add more options and smarter defaults around multiple compute environments. Um, so we're always trying to optimize spot. It's kind of an auction where you're competing against other people, so that's a bit of a moving target. Um, so we're working on that. We also want to change the output path structure. This is a very minor change, but um, everything is kind of put out flat, and we want to create a directory structure so you can have um, different outputs named the same thing. Uh, we also want to support multiple tagged compute environments for per workflow cost breakdowns. Uh, we've been really interested in cost optimization. And now that we have three different workflows, they've all been mixed together. Uh, and we want to be able to tag those and tell the cost to different workflows apart. Uh, and we more. Uh, I also just want to um, take some time to uh, do some acknowledgments. Uh, I'm the one talking here today, but this was like a massive uh, group effort uh, on the part of a lot of people from my team. So obviously, the Chen Zuckerberg Foundation uh, Andre uh, Kisiuk, who's laid a lot of the foundations and groundwork for this. Uh, Mike Lin, who is the author of Miniwiddle, who is also instrumental in helping us integrate that into Swipe, as well as Emmanuel Beze, 
uh, Jay Keith and David Tsai, who were contributors of various features, including security features. <coughs> Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, very nice talk. Uh, quick question. Uh, if I understood correctly, there is no hard coupling between the uh, uh, workflow the WDL and the uh, and the infrastructure code that you presented. So in theory, one could also swap it out for, for example, you know, some next flow engines, and uh, everything should still work, right? Just to be a bit more specific, is it um, running a next flow on Swipe, or is it running uh, uh, directly on on your infrastructure? Because um, what you've shown so far is, you know, it's yeah, it's uh, it's just a AWS pure, you know, pure AWS infrastructure, right? Yeah, that is something we definitely want to add is running Nextflow. Uh, there would be one kind of problem in practice, not in theory, with doing that right now, but it is definitely theoretically possible. OK, thanks. Any other question? So uh, I have one. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I was just uh, wondering about the, the cache uh, strategy that you have for the results of workflow steps mm -hmm. uh, are uh, are these cache data shareable between different workflow runs or is it something that you uh, keep on uh, on a specific workflow or user what is the level of sharing of the cache data yeah that's actually a great question uh, so currently we're only sharing it on a particular run and using it to recover from an interruption due to spot what we want to hopefully do in the future um, is allow it to be completely generic where we have a more global cache. So sometimes we have uh, failures due to say like code problems. So it would be really great if we could reuse the first half of the workflow. And there's nothing in theory about how we construct the cache keys that prevent us from that. Uh, it's just that we always keep them under the same particular uh, S3 prefix. So we're not uh, cross using them yet, but that is something we want to pursue. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay.